In December of 1993, Russian artists Vitaly Komar and Alexander Melamed used a professional research firm to run a survey asking over a thousand Americans a series of art-related questions. What is your favorite color? Do you prefer paintings of indoor or outdoor scenes? What is your preferred season? Do you prefer blended or separate colors? Do you prefer sharp angles or soft curves? What is the preferred painting size? And many, many more. The idea behind it all, as they say, was if politicians and entrepreneurs use polls, why not artists? The goal was to create the most and least wanted painting for the United States based on this data. Some of the answers were, in my opinion, surprising. 62% preferred non-religious subjects, and a whopping 71% preferred simple art over busy art. Others were more expected. When asked which artists were the most favorable, Norman Rockwell came out on top. The data was gathered and then turned into this painting, a dreamlike landscape full of blue, with what looks to be a hiking family, and yes, George Washington, awkwardly standing in the middle of the composition like a child who's lost his mother in the grocery store. They also created America's least wanted painting with the same data, a field of brightly colored abstracted shapes with an encroaching vignette. After Komar and Melamed unveiled this work at the Manhattan Museum in 1994 under the name The People's Choice, they were commissioned to expand their survey, this time gathering information from participants in 13 other countries. China, for example, also preferred landscapes with an overwhelming amount of blue. Kenya had a preference for religious themes, as you can see by Jesus in the center. Russia was a landscape with bears. Holland was the only country that preferred abstraction over representation while their least wanted painting was an impressionistic jumble of items I can't even begin to decipher. Then the duo brought their survey online, conducting it on the Dia Center for Arts website, and produced the web's most and least wanted paintings using the same kind of questions as the country surveys. The most wanted was a surreal depiction of what looks like a colorful modern work inside a kitchen cabinet, as a Dalmatian stares at the viewer. The least wanted was a child laying on top of a chair in a strange room filled with yellow objects. Komar and Melamed even moved their invention of survey art to a new medium, with the talents of musicians Dave Soldier and lyricist Nina Mankin, they created an album under the name The People's Choice, containing the tracks The Most Wanted Song and The Most Unwanted Song. The survey results showed people preferred about a five minute long song with a group of instruments consisting of guitar, piano, bass, drums, cello, and violin, with low male and female vocals singing in a rock slash R&B style. People did not prefer wild changes in volume, tempo, pitch, and abrupt transitions, with an orchestra of accordion, bagpipe, banjo, flute, tuba, harp, and organ, with opera singing, rap, advertising jingles, political slogans, and, ch and children singing. The only instrument to appear in both was the synthesizer. The Most Wanted song is a perfectly fine piece of music. It's a generic love song between two singers over an upbeat by the numbers progression with a noticeable 90s tinge. The most unwanted song is one of the most tonally jarring, frighteningly experimental pieces of music I've ever listened to. And believe me, I've listened to a lot. There's this rapping opera singer throughout that then moves to bagpipes and then children singing about Walmart. It transitions from segment to segment with all the grace of a rusty Chuck E. Cheese animatronic, merging polar opposite musical elements together in a way that can only be listened to to be believed. With no hint of sarcasm, I can say, it's not terrible. In a way, the heavily contrasting elements give it a brand new sound that honestly, I can appreciate outside of being a novelty song, although it does overstay its welcome. There's a short documentary I suggest you watch, which shows when played at a club, even though they are made to be opposites and appealing to people, they were both appreciated by dancers. But of course, these aren't the most wanted paintings. This isn't the most wanted music. For Americans, if I had to guess, if asked what they would want as a painting in their home, they would choose famous already existing paintings of simple landscapes, depictions of the Old West, or yes, probably paintings of George Washington, paintings that represent and helped form the American spirit already. For music, the answer would be much more simple, the literal top tens of that given year. Realistically, it would be very hard to create art that really appeals to people with this method without revealing its obvious underlying robotic patchwork. For one thing, the surveys used are limited. For the most wanted painting, there are no questions about the composition, for example. 
Where should George Washington be placed? How big should he be? Some options given are just kind of odd. For the music survey, you have all these broad categories in this one section, but then for some reason it singles out cowboys. You can only ask so many predetermined questions, and sometimes those questions can unintentionally mean different things to different people. And on top of all that, taste changes constantly. These artworks are more or less light satire based on real data. The artist duo made it as a commentary on the nature of democracy, populism and elitism, opinion poll politics, and market research consumerism. Although I like many of these paintings, I think they're delightfully kooky. This project doesn't give us the works of art that would actually appeal to the most people. It doesn't give us the song that most people would actually listen to, at least outside of the theoretical realm. But it does show, to an extent, the general direction of a majority of people's tastes representational subjects with comforting and serene themes over cold abstraction, upbeat harmony over discordant sounds and unusual instruments. And that's the thing about taste, isn't it? You can't please everybody. You'll end up pleasing no one. Or can you? Star Wars might be the franchise with the widest audience in history, appealing to anyone from preteens to middle-aged adults. One of the reasons it's so popular even to this day is that it's based on the hero's journey, a monomyth that can be found in almost every widespread story ever told if you look for it. The reason the monomyth is so prevalent is precisely because it appeals to so many people's psychology. It appeals to the process in which everybody faces challenges in their own lives. But what do we mean by everybody? There's probably some remote tribe in the Amazon jungle that won't understand a single thing you present to them. In fact, the bright screens we use to show our art to them might give them a headache. I know it does to me. You'd either have to physically bring a painting to them or have something with the brightness of a Kindle. In all seriousness, the paintings made with this survey are jarring because they have so many conflicting elements that they probably wouldn't appeal to many people at all. And the most wanted song is just so generic and soulless it's kind of mind-numbing. But I don't think it's impossible to create art or music with the given elements in a way that is sincerely appealing. It might be tough, but I could think of some ways an artist or musician could combine the given elements harmoniously. At the end of the day, it isn't about the ideas used, but the quality of the craft. Thomas Kincaid, Bob Ross, Norman Rockwell, Frederick Remington, and maybe Andy Warhol are some American popular artists. What I mean by that is there's paintings and painters everyone knows, but if we're talking about artwork the average person hangs in their home and actually buys prints of in mass quantities, it's probably artists like those. These are artists that appeal to a lot of people outside of the art world. When I made my video on Thomas Kincaid, I got a lot of people telling me why they liked or didn't like his art. The reasons why, of course, varied. But a very common explanation I heard from those who held a negative opinion of his work was this. Buying and viewing Thomas Kincaid's art is like eating McDonald's or comfort food. Yeah, it may taste good at first, but if you eat enough of it, you'll start to feel sick. While a fair way to make that point, I could totally see how someone could view it that way. This is, of course, just an analogy. If you eat McDonald's all the time, you are going to develop tangible health issues. If you look at Kincaid art all the time, you aren't. Although it may feel like it, no one is going to develop heart disease by collecting Kincaid art. When we accuse people of having bad taste for media, there is of course no tangible harm to themselves or anyone else, but sometimes we act like it does. Personal taste is so arbitrary, especially when we aren't talking about craft. So many people hate Crocs, despite the fact that they are perfectly functional, comfortable, and convenient, and people insist on calling them ugly despite the fact that these exist, and how come bell bottoms are back for like the third time? Sometimes people will tell others they have bad taste, that what they enjoy is bad, and maybe it is. But here's the thing, at least they found what they enjoy, what they want. Because a lot of the time, people don't know what they want. When Forbes made a survey in 2016 asking what people wanted most in life, number four was peace, number three was freedom, pretty based, number two was money, and number one was, of course, happiness. The biggest challenge to this? Not knowing what I want to do. People will generally think they know what they want for the future, but realistically, your judgments of what you think will make you happy, the intensity of that happiness, and how long you'll be happy, is all subject to a multitude of biases. You may think when you finally get that video game you've been wanting to buy for so long, it's going to be great, and you find out it's just pretty good. 
Or if there's some song you haven't listened to in a long time and you hype yourself up to listen to it again, it's good, but not as good as you remembered. Not knowing what you want may manifest itself in more counterintuitive ways. In one study, two groups had taken a series of photographs, and at the end of the session, they were both instructed that they would keep one photo for themselves and one for the researchers' collection. The first group was given the choice to take one home and have the freedom to swap it out with the other if they ever wanted to. The other group was told, once they chose which photograph to keep and which to let go, their decision was final. It may seem that the ones with the more freedom would be happier, but on the contrary, those who had made the irreversible decision were happier, because afterwards, they rationalized it. Those with the freedom to swap ruminated over their choice. They were plagued with feelings of uncertainty about whether they chose the right photo. A quote widely attributed to Henry Ford, with no real evidence he said it, is, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Steve Jobs once said in an interview, a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. These quotes are amusing thought fuel, but they're really only true in a specific context. People in the late 1800s probably would have asked not for faster horses, but for a faster method of transportation. Steve Jobs created brand new product categories. To ask customers what they want in these scenarios would be more or less pointless. You might as well ask them what new technology they should invent. But there's still a grain of truth to these statements. When user interviews are conducted, typically designers are not trying to get them to tell them how or what to design, but their goals and needs outside of the product being developed. Market research focuses on gathering data about what people want, but you need researchers and designers to translate that data into something people want. And although companies every once in a while will instigate a PR disaster, create an annoying ad, or release a bafflingly stupid product, they still often hit the mark with wider audiences. And in my experience, they seem to be getting worryingly better. If you asked me a year ago what I would most enjoy for entertainment, my answers would probably not be someone 3D printing and collecting almost exclusively Jabba the Hutt models and memorabilia, and a British man going into way too much detail about siege ladders and sterling engines. I wasn't brought there because I searched those specific topics. I was brought there by an algorithm. It's easy to see the dystopian lining to things like targeted advertisements and algorithms, but if I'm going to be perfectly honest with myself, those things can be pretty damn convenient. My videos always seem to mention AI at some point, but it really applies here. If they get advanced enough, AI algorithms could easily build highly complex files of customers and begin to find out not only what you want, but what you don't know you want. Furthermore, the most wanted painting might be able to be generated by an AI in theory. One could combine huge amounts of data and already existing paintings into something that could really appeal to the widest audience possible. Or at least, with more data being considered, you could get a lot closer. These projects show that people have a lot of different tastes, but there's also a lot of surprising similarity from country to country. Something as simple as favorite color varies wildly in the lower percentages, but for the most part, for whatever reason, most people preferred blue. If there is a lesson or an idea to share from all this, I guess it would be to like what you like. But maybe move out of your comfort zone. If you don't know what you want, then there's no harm in trying new things. 